Elisa Permain is from Hudson, Massachusetts. She is a storyteller who's been telling stories professionally in schools, conferences, festivals, libraries, and churches for over 30 years. Her roots in storytelling go back to first being a dancer, where she felt she could not get her story across, uh, um, however, until she found a dance theater, and then she found storytelling. She's also a licensed psychotherapist who's used story and narrative therapy with individuals, groups, hospitals, clinical, and private practice settings. And she has a special interest in forgiveness, the process, and recently recorded a double CD called Forgiveness, Telling Our Stories in New Ways. Recently, Elisa presented her workshop on forgiveness through story at the National Con uh, Storytelling Conference in Richmond, Virginia. And she's an award-winning author of two collections of wisdom tales, Doorways to the Soul, including 52 wisdom tales from around the world, and Once Upon a Time, Storytelling to Teach Character and Prevent Bullying. And when asked, why do we share, why should we share stories and other art forms with community? Elisa said, we share in the experience together and our common humanity is made more clear. Through the vicarious experience of story listeners and tellers alike, open their hearts and imaginations to the experience of being human and to possibility. So here to share some of her stories with us today that involve and focus on healing is Elisa Permain. Please give her a warm round of applause. Thanks. As a therapist, I'm learning, the longer I'm doing it, that the best part of my job is to help someone on their journey to be able to um, internalize the resources of compassion, empathy, and love that they may not have been given. And so I'd like to share my first story on, about such a journey. And this is a folk tale from Egypt that I first read from uh, the author Joan Marshall Grant. Long ago in Egypt, in a small village that stood just beyond where the green valley meets the desert, there lived a 12-year-old boy named Myobi with his parents. Now Myobi's father was a skilled and courageous hunter. He was the one that they would call if a lion was picking off the herds or a crocodile was menacing the villages. And so naturally, Myobi's father wanted to train his son to be a skilled and courageous hunter. There was just one problem. Myobi was afraid of everything. Why, he was afraid of the dark, the water, animals, his uncle Fred. The real truth of it was, was that Myobi had a wonderful imagination but he used it in terrible ways, for he used it to imagine all the horrible things that could happen. For instance, if he was lying in his bed at night, he would imagine that a great black spider came across the ceiling, dropped on a single thread to his chest, ran to his face, and it seemed so real. He, he, he could barely breathe. He could barely hear his heartbeat. Now, one day, his mother said to him that she wanted him to go down to the river with some pots that needed mending. He immediately began to imagine having to walk the short path through the forest to the river and how a cheetah in a tree would drop from the tree, knock him to the ground, bite his neck, and he cried out. It seemed so real. And his parents said, my Obi, what has happened? And when he told them, his father turned three shades of purple and he said, how are you going to become a hunter if you can't even walk from the village to the river? You are going on the journey. We're taking a trip. No, you alone are going on a journey to master your fear and find courage and you will not come back until you have. Here, take my dagger. Don't run with it. And so, with the few things that his mother could throw together, Myobi was pushed out on the path heading away from his village. The further he got from his village, the louder the sounds became and the greater his fear. It seemed that every bird was crying, danger, danger. 
and the further he got, he, he began to hear the sounds in the undergrowth, and it, it seemed to him in his mind that all the little animals were, were rushing in one direction, the way he was going, and, and he thought, why would they be rushing? Oh, wild dogs, he thought. It's wild dogs, and they picked up my scent, and, 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 they're, and they're chasing me, and he began to run and run and run, and he was sure he could feel their hot breath right behind him, and he turned to see them tripped over a root and fell upon the ground. He lay there for some time until he realized that something was watching him. It was a rabbit. Observation. A young man, rushing along as though in mortal danger, trips and falls to the ground. What has happened? My father said I had to go on a journey to find my, master my fear and find courage, but I think my fears are, are mastering me. Fascinating. Suggestion. Why not pick me up, carry me a while, and perhaps I could provide some advice. Pick you up? <laughs> Strictly vegetarian. Mm -hmm. And so Myobi picked up the rabbit, which was a little bit heavy, but soft and warm against his chest, and, and it felt good. And, and they began to walk down the path, which led out of the forest and into the fields, and he could see the mountains in the distance. Suggestion, said the rabbit after a time. Let me give you some advice. I watch and listen to you. Your heart, it speeds up and slows down. What, what is going on? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the terrible things that could happen. Like, you see those birds of prey? Well, I'm just imagining that they'll see us and, and they'll drop down and you'll hop away, but they'll grab me and they'll lift me up and they'll, and they'll take me over the rocks and drop me and I'll, and I'll break and die. And, and whew, Suggestion, said the rabbit. Why not try thinking like a rabbit? We do not trouble ourselves with what could happen. We think about what is happening. <laughs> Novel concept, I know. <laughs> we keep our eyes, our ears open. We take one step, one breath. And that way, we keep ourselves safe. And, ha <laughs> bonus, we enjoy our surroundings. Try it. And so Myobi tried, taking a breath and a step and noticing that actually it was a beautiful day with the blue sky and he could hear the small birds and, and see the wildflowers. And, in this way, they walked quite a distance, and whenever Myobi began to think fearful thoughts, the rabbit would give him a little nip, and he'd come back to the present moment. Well, after a time, at about noon, they came to a crossroad. Observation, we have come to the end of our time together. For I must go that way, but I suggest that you go that way. For that way will lead you to the land of the fear monster. Oh no, no monsters. <laughs> Do you wish to master your fear and be able to go home? then you must find the fear monster and learn from him the nature of fear. Let me give you some suggestions. You will come to a land where people tell you terrible, horrible things about the fear monster, but you must not, must not listen to any one of them who has not seen it with their own eyes. And remember, think like a rabbit. Farewell. And the rabbit was gone. And Myobi began to feel afraid, but then his imagination had a wonderful thought. I'll pretend I'm still holding the rabbit, and that will give me courage. And it did. And in this way, he walked one step, one breath, looking at the sky and the trees, until he came to a river. Oh, I hate rivers, crocodiles and hippos. Oh, <laughs> suggestion. I think like a rabbit. Could there's some rocks I could cross? Oh, but one of them moved. <laughs> it was a crocodile rock. He said, I'm, I'm glad I noticed. And he, and he found up ahead a bridge, a real bridge that he could safely cross. And he felt proud of himself for having used his mindfulness. Well, he walked again in the same way until it began to become later in the day. And finally, up close to the mountains, he came to a village. And he could see that there was some great, something terribly wrong in this village, for the goats were grazing in the gardens. There were children with torn clothes wandering this way and that. And, and from the, the far end of the village, from a great hut, he could hear a terrible moaning. As he got closer and closer and looked through the open door, he could see that all of the adults in the village were sitting and rocking back and forth, along with their chief headman, who had a head the size of a full moon, who was moaning, all gonna die, all gonna die. Excuse me, he said, could somebody 
tell me how to find the fear monster? A foolish boy, foolish boy. Why would you wish to find the fear monster? Why, he's going to be here any day. Why, someone told me yesterday they saw someone who hurt someone who knew someone who said that it was bigger than the most giant hippop hippopotamus could squ squash a village flat. But have you seen it yourself? No, foolish boy, I haven't seen it, but, but my uncle told me my aunt said she knew someone who heard someone who said they saw someone who said it was, it was bigger than the greatest crocodile could snort fire, burn down the whole village in a single snort. But you haven't seen it with your own eyes? No, foolish boy. How would I find the fear monster? A foolish boy, just follow the path up the, up the mountain to the cave, but don't bring him back. <laughs> so Myobi left the village walking one foot, one breath, noticing the sun getting lower in the sky. And he could see at the top of the mountain that coming from what might have been a cave was a great huge plume of smoke and his heart filled with fear. But he kept his eyes in front of him, breath, and step, and wild rose. And when he got further, he looked up again and he saw that plume of smoke, but it was quite a bit smaller. And the sky was tinged with pink. And in this way, he walked until he stood in front of that cave. He clutched the dagger just in case. Fear monster, fear monster. Oh, observation, that was me. Fear monster. And then he heard from the back of the cave. Until something warm touched his foot and Looking down, there was a tiny creature, the, the size of a bullfrog, making perfect smoke rings from its nose. I said, what do you want with the fear monster? I, um, I want to meet it. <laughs> well, you met me. Pick me up. Pick you up? Wait a minute. No, do, do you grow to be ten times bigger than the biggest hippo? Nope. Do you, uh, do you turn into a giant crocodile who snorts fire? Nope. What is this? 20 questions? <laughs> Love the game. <laughs> Pick me up. Okay. What, what you see is what you are? That's right. Pick me up. So he picked up this little creature. It said, ha, there now. Ha. Can you take me, huh? Can you handle me, huh? 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 Can you? I hope he said, I am. Um, I think I am handling you, aren't, aren't I? <laughs> Bingo! Another good game. That's the secret to fear. Things always seem worse when you're worrying about them in advance than when you're facing them in the moment. You're right. I, I am facing you, and it's okay. You're right. Oh, Fear Monster, thank you so much. That, that's so wonderful. I, I better go, though, because it's, it's getting dark, and I'm afraid of the... Oh, wait a minute. I'm not afraid. I'm just going to be smart. Thank you, Fear Monster. Thank you so much. And Myobi left the cave, and he ran down that hill. He was so excited to get back to the village, and he gathered the villagers, and he told them all about the nature of fear and the Fear Monster. Oh, brave boy, brave boy, said the headman. Stay, be our new headman. You're so wise. But Myobi didn't want to stay and be a headman. He wanted to go back to his village and be a boy. So the next morning, he rose early, and he started on his way. And he kept with him the courage and the warmth and the wisdom of that rabbit, that mindful presence. And he kept with him the wisdom of the fear monster, that he would wait, and he would be able to handle things when they happened. And he remembered his own stories of how he had helped himself to cross the river, to make his journey. And when he returned to the village and his father saw him, he knew that Myobi was healed. Now you might wonder, did Myobi become a skilled and courageous hunter? Perhaps. But I like to think that with that lovely imagination, which was now put to good, that he became a storyteller, a poet, an artist. And that's the story of the fear monster. I think life is such a dance, isn't it, between that which we fear and that which we love and hope for. 
It's wonderful to have have these tools of presence and and uh, encourage. Now, in my work um, as a therapist, I have found that just about everyone who comes to me is struggling with some kind of resentment or hurts or anger that they're holding either against someone else or even more often deep down uh, towards themselves. And so I've you know, learned a lot, of, a lot about the tasks of forgiveness and what, what is really involved in forgiveness. And um, one very short story that I like to share with people in the session um, is a Sufi tale that, uh, as Raphael spoke about, is, is all about empathy. And uh, it goes like this. Once, a dervish teacher and his student were walking down a long, dusty road from one village to another. The day was hot, and they walked in silence. When all of a sudden they noticed from around the, bed in the bend in the road a great cloud of smoke was rising, dust, excuse me, dust was rising, and as uh, in time around the bend came a great horse, three horse, four horse, three, ever seen a three horse carriage? <laughs> a four horse carriage with a driver urging the horses on. And the dervish and his student noticed that they were not slowing when they clearly saw the old man and they were not veering out of the way. No, the driver urged them straight on, straight towards them until at the last second that dervish and his student had to literally jump into the ditch where they fell into the brambles and the thorns. Well, the student being younger was the quicker to his feet and, and he raised his fist to curse at this driver. But the teacher got up behind him and he, and he stayed his student hand, student's hand and he called out, may all your deepest needs and dreams be satisfied. And the student said, teacher, why did you wish him that? He just, he could, you could have been badly hurt. And the teacher said, do you think if that man's deepest needs and dreams were really satisfied, he would have been so unconscious as to throw an old man and his student in a ditch? I think not. And so what I love to think about after that is, well, why was he in such a hurry as to not be able to be sensitive to other people? There were some needs that he was trying to meet, right? Maybe his wife was pregnant in the back of the carriage. Uh, maybe he forgot he left the stove on. <laughs> maybe he was being chased by robbers. We don't know. But we can trust that there was some human need, that we all have the same basic human needs, that he was trying to meet. And in that way, perhaps, not only feel empathy for him, but not take it personally, right? That's what we do when something happens in, um, and we feel victimized, we feel hurt. That person did that to me, we feel ashamed. You know, what does this say about me? But in truth, it's not about us at all. It's about the person who's trying to meet their own needs. And I think to be able to shift and look at our stories, you know, to, you know when my clients bring me these painful stories, well, what, what was going on with that person that made them do that? It's not about you. Or what was going on with you when you did something you regret? What needs were you trying to meet? human needs, and it really helps to, to develop compassion. So I may have enough time to tell uh, one more story that I was inspired to tell um, after learning about the passing of Nelson Mandela, who um, taught me so much about forgiveness, as, as all of us, I'm sure. Um, this, I had read about a South African ritual, a, a writer from Africa named um, Mala Dome Doma Some, if I got that right, um, told a meditation teacher I've studied with about um, a ritual of the Babema tribe in South Africa that when, um, and I will, it's a little bigger story, but I'll try to fit it in <laughs> to the time frame. So on the outskirts of the village, um, I'm telling it as a story. He, he told it as a ritual. Uh, there was a hut where people would go when they had committed a crime, some offense against the community. And they would stay until the elders decided their fate. 
Well, in the hut on this particular day, a 13-year-old boy was pacing. He had been about to be involved in one of the initiation rituals where they had to show their skill at spear hunting. And he had been afraid that his skills weren't as good as one of his friends. And he had gone to the friend's hut and he had loosened the head of his spear. And so when his friend had thrown, of course, it had wobbled and gone short and caused some wildebeest to come and almost stampede the hunting party. Well, he was waiting regretfully in the hut, wondering what his fate would be when his father came and said, it is time. The elders have met with your friend who was wounded, and they have gathered all the villagers together. And so Tunji, the boy, came to the village, and he saw his friend who he had who he had hurt, Obi, and he saw all the elders and the villagers. And the elders stood and said, Tunji, what you have done was very harmful to the villagers. Someone could have been injured. And when one person is injured, everyone is injured. And you embarrassed your friend. When one person is embarrassed, everyone is embarrassed. Do you understand? And he said, I do, and I'm, I'm so sorry. Good, said the elder. He said, we are going now to tell you stories about yourself because we do not want to think of you as someone who can do wrong. And we do not want you to think of just as yourself as someone who can do wrong. And so he began to ask people from the village to speak about what they knew, the whole story about Tunji. And a woman spoke and she said, Tunji, you're very generous. When my husband broke his leg, you spent a whole season helping me to carry wood. Another man spoke and said, Tunji, you don't need to be jealous of another. You have skills as a fisherman. I've seen how careful you are when you pull in the nets. And a young person stood up and said, Tunji, you don't need to be jealous. Why, you're so funny. You make us laugh all the time. Like that time we had to dance in front of the elders and we were so nervous and you started to flap your arms like a chicken and jump up and down and you made us laugh, Tunji. You make us laugh a lot. One after the other, people began to share their stories about Tunji. And he began to remember that there was more to him than just someone who could do harm. And at last, Obi, the friend who had been hurt, rose up and said, Tunji, you have been a good friend to me at times. You have listened to me. I want to remember you that way. I want to forgive you. And Tunji said, I thank you. I would give anything for your forgiveness, my friend. I will try to never hurt you again. And the whole tribe rose, singing with joy. For when we can hold each other in wholeness, we can be whole, and we can all be healed. And that is the story of Tunji. Breaking news, Dallas, 1963. Her gloves blood smeared now, broadcast a nation's sorrow. Shock, disbelief, grief, the shifting of our tomorrows. shows up unexpected never calls ahead one bright morning there you'll find her on your doorstep dressed in red brings a spray of purple aster jug of cider maybe wine and all you know is autumn's looking fine Autumn always brings you presents. Bag of apples, pumpkin pie. She takes you out to climb the mountains. Silhouetted on the sky. Harvest moon above the hills. Bold Orion burning bright. Autumn shows you magic in the night. Autumn sometimes melancholy, sometimes cheerful, sometimes chill. When she greets you in the morning, 
never know what face she will be wearing. But those constant changes serve to keep you on your toes. Who you'll meet tomorrow, only autumn knows. Autumn wants to wander, here to visit, not to stay. Restless feet and swirling skirts, here's the call then on her way. Fire burning on the hearth, glowing coals to warm the evening. Still the world's a little colder when autumn leaves. Days are growing longer, but the winds are blowing stronger. It's time for winter's song when autumn leaves. Thank you. Leaves, they die and lie on the ground. They tumble and crumble to dust. They must break down to become tiny parts to replenish the whole, fertilizer. Evergreen needles endure for sure. They remain the same throughout the year, staying green throughout the cold and snow, letting you know that with life's experiences, some you must let go. Let them break down and disintegrate, tiny parts becoming fertilizer for the greater whole. But other experiences endure. They're steady and sure, content lifelong. And it's these experiences we celebrate at winter solstice time, the constant essence experience of life, evergreen. Rosemary.